the way from Ireland, my friend. Great call this morning. Thank you so much. Jake E. Bakey in the house. Uh, let's pin up some information on uh, the training Friday. That'd be great. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Just Stone J. Johnson. Welcome. Let's get a question going. Here we go. All right. How can I be more aware of my superpowers and weaknesses? Uh, the first thing to realize is that every weakness is a superpower put into the right place. Uh, and so you got to realize there's a story about uh, the CEO of SAP and he couldn't figure out how um, he was going to hire enough test uh, people for software because the problem with testing software is you have to sit there all day repetitively do the exact same thing over and over again and human beings get super bored with that and it was very difficult to find those people so he was very perplexed because he had to hire thousands of these people and it was going to be very very expensive because he would have to go in shifts because you know it would just have to be a partial project or a partial responsibility of people because they can't withstand that all day long, repetitively testing software repetitively, but yet they needed the human human interaction in order to facilitate the true testing, uh, because no matter how strong AI is, there's nothing like human error, and that's what you're looking for combined with the software errors and to figure out those bugs and how the human mind works. Well, anyway, he goes home and he's stressed over it, and uh, he looks over and his son is on the spectrum, he has autism, and he notices his son who loves to do the exact same thing again and again and again and again, and it makes him feel good. And to this day, SAP has hired thousands of people on the spectrum, making great money, feeling great about themselves. Society has looked upon that as a weakness, right? But it's a superpower. And so what I want you to do is to identify what your superpowers are within the context of what situation you're in, and see how you can move your weaknesses to a different situation where they can be a superpower. Really great uh, lesson. Uh, there's superpowers in everything. If you focus in on your superpowers, that's what you'll get more of. If you focus in other people's superpowers, that way you will get more of as well. Um, what does happiness mean to you? How do you navigate difficult situations or days? Uh, um, happiness to me is the enjoyment of the consistent persistent, consistent every day, persistent without quit, pursuit of your potential, that is happiness. Can you find the light, the love, and the lessons in everything that you do? Can you enjoy the pursuit? You know, happiness, there is no pursuit of happiness. Happiness is the pursuit. So if you can stay in pursuit, in other words, keep expanding, learning, feeling stuck, all of those different things, you absolutely will be happy. Um, and in order, when things get difficult, challenging, when there's obstacles, voids, and shortages, that's when we have pain. Pain's an indicator that you have something to learn. So what do we do? We seek the lesson that you're looking for. Seek the light, the love, and the lessons in the situation. You'll be able to smile through struggle. You'll be able to expand and accelerate at an unbelievable rate uh, to become better and more happy or happier. Maybe I could practice appropriate English. What are some tips regarding staying within our center or coming back quickly when off balance? One, we have to know our baseline. So uh, in other words, we have to know when we are not at our highest frequency, not at our highest vibration, not at center, not feeling good. So our thermostat, number one, has to be the way we feel. Not our bank account like it was for me in the past, but it has to be the way we feel, right? A bank account for me is just an ingredient in the mercury that determines how I feel. Uh, but you need to identify, one, how I feel, two, know that baseline for the day, and use that baseline to, two, be aware of when and what puts me off of that baseline. The need to be, for me, the need to be right, the need to be offended, the need to be resentful, the need to be separate, the need to be inferior, the need to be superior, all of these different things, not as much angry, anxious, frustrated, worrying, guilty a little bit, but I'm aware of all these things. And so when I am, I'm a ferocious boot. I'm ferocious about stopping, ferocious about dropping down to center to that baseline from the earlier beginning of the day. And more importantly, ferocious about moving in the right direction. Do you meditate? Absolutely. Uh, every day, 20 minutes, 4 a.m. to 4.20 a.m. Every single day, Pacific time, I'm meditating 
Theta meditation is the utiliz- the tool that I utilize. Do you have any tips for negotiating a win-win situation when it comes to partnership share agreements? Yeah, three tips. One, always be fair. Two, don't negotiate to the last penny. Three, don't do business with dicks. Uh, it's about as fair in situation as I can in any partnership uh, that you can come to. Um, all right, how to make sure your team stays on task without micromanaging. Uh, I'm sure, Blaine, that you probably are a person that feels sometimes that you're being micromanaged. And uh, the reason is, as I've found, is people live below the line and blame, shame, and justification. Think about what you're saying. How do you feel? You're being micromanaged. Think about what you're saying. What is your attitude then? Right? For me, I would love for someone to pay attention to and give attention to me. And if they're doing that at a steady pace in an intense rate, that means, number one, they care about me. They, too, think I have potential. And But yet, the closed-minded, resistant-full employees out there that feel like they're being micromanaged, why? Because you're not doing your job, bro. You are insecure about your job. Because if you weren't, you would be rejoicing in the fact of the way that your boss feels about you. That you have potential and you're worth his time. But no, like everybody else, the 87% out there, you take a negative perspective, right? And now you're a victim. Oh my God, my boss is micromanaging me. No, your boss cares about you and thinks you have potential and you're not doing what you're supposed to be doing. So you feel an ego-based emotion of guilt that, oh my God, he's looking over my shoulder. Now he knows I'm just watching Instagram all day. Now he knows I'm doing shit that I'm not supposed to be doing, right? Let's be honest out there. Trust me. You know, some of my worst employees ever. That was their big complaint. Oh, he micromanages me. Meanwhile, why? Because I thought they had way more potential and they weren't doing their job correctly. They needed help. And they weren't asking for it. Worst worst thing ever uh, as an employee. Total exposure of who you are. Uh, right on. I'm a lawyer and motivational speaker. Awesome. Well, half Awesome. I'm a recovering lawyer and motivational speaker. I'm also an inspirational speaker. Would you love to do a live with you? Yeah, let's do a live, man, for sure. Uh, let's get it arranged. Would we'll, we'll love to do that. How do you change that? Hi, Leanne. Change what? Sorry, I'm, the notes are always behind what I'm talking about. So, Leanne, clarify what, uh, how we change. Advice for dealing with a chronic health issue. Um, wow. You know, so here, when you have a chronic health issue, it, you have to look at it in three different realms because it's so difficult for people because there's the conscious realm and how to deal with it. Right. So you want to make sure that you have positive inputs, that you are healthy. So mantras, I am healthy. Then you're going Western and Eastern, Eastern methodologies of how to treat a chronic at the conscious level. And you should be doing all of those things. Uh, but then also exploring, um, exploring the the, uh, the the subconscious side of your chronic disease, right? What are your belief systems, right? Do you, you know, feel, believe that, that you are healthy, that you are one? But the hardest part about a chronic disease is I believe it, it actually exists in the unconscious, right? So you have to shift your energy. It's an ancestral thing, you know, it's handed down from your great grandparents, your grandparents, your parents to you, right? Th- this is what health is. It's the being, the essence. And so it, it may or may not be able to be completely resolved during your lifetime, determined upon what that is. And maybe if you believe like me in multiple lifetimes, it's even more concreted into your quantum memory and, and your DNA. You know, there's a certain and you have to deactivate that DNA that holds, you know, that that incongruency, uh, that corrosion and interference to the greatest source of light, love and lessons and health that you're always committed to. But the best that you could enjoy is enjoy the consistent, persistent pursuit of that healthy potential. Uh, And whether it occurs in this lifetime or the next, you're going to be better off by enjoying that pursuit of being healthy. You are health and then you can give health. You are love and you can give love. These are all great things uh, that that you can do. Um, Sorry, Leanne, I'm going to answer that question. I saw that up there. Uh, The employee negative mindset when they have potential. So everything that I teach is a practice. So, 
you know, how, how do we resolve uh, that is that, you know, you have to ask for help, right? You have to be grateful for when the people around you are giving you help, right? You have to be uh, in truth consciousness of, oh my gosh, this is something that I could work on. I'm excited to live in the learning zone and expand and accelerate to improve my skills, improve my knowledge and increase my desire to be what I must be. And this person is taking the time while he's paying me money in order to effectuate that, right? It's all mindset and heart set. You can control the way you think, the way you feel, you can control what you do, what you hear and what you say. You know, if, if you literally, right, the same exact person, you could come and say, hey, uh, let me look and see what you're working on. How can I help? What do you like about it? What don't you like about it? Have you ever thought about doing this? One employee would be so gracious and be like, I am so lucky. And I have this almost every day in my own business. Oh my God, thank you so much for your help. Thank you. And then the exact same situation, doing the exact same management style. Oh, he's micromanaging me. I don't like it here. Whether you think so or not, either way you're right. Right? Maybe you're in the wrong place. If you feel like you're being micromanaged in your job, maybe you're in the wrong job. Right? Go find somewhere where people will leave you alone. Be a toll booth operator. Right? A toll booth operator. Nobody's going to micromanage you. You can sit in the toll booth all day and collect quarters and dimes and nickels. Right? And you can probably grow at a very incremental rate while you're doing that. I'm sure there's some way you can improve yourself. Or you can have a coach push you for your potential. Not micromanage you, wants you to be better. Change your mindset, change your life. Uh, How to get the first client, ask, right? So in person, on the phone, via email and media, radio, print, TV, ask. Don't charge them, ask, right? Maybe provide a guarantee of value, whatever it may be, but keep asking until someone says yes and then Stimulate interest, transition interest, share a vision, manage and develop that vision, and it will grow. They will tell somebody else, you got to go, this person's awesome, let's build. And then two becomes four, four becomes eight, eight becomes 16. In the segmentation and incremental growth and acceleration, you can do that. You're welcome, Leanne. Uh, Let's go here to the next question. Best time to work out. Not, there is no best time to work out. It's every day for a minimum of an hour a day to focus in on your health. That's my advice, but every single day is the best time. Uh, It doesn't matter what time it is. I would suggest not 30 minutes before you go to bed. Uh, You know, that that does affect the way you sleep, Um, but you're better off affecting, you know, and working out every day than anything else, taking care of a minimum of uh, an hour a day for your your health. What's the best app for stock market trade? No idea, but find someone that's been trading stocks for 30 years and ask them. That's my best piece of advice for finding the best app for stock market trade. (laughs) That's my boy Liam from Ireland. Very good. Uh, If the frequency of your brand something you find through learning or is it something that is built? Combination thereof, right? And that's what we're going to talk about on Friday. Uh, You know, go ahead. You can text me at 949-298-2905. Or email me, david at dmelzer.com, to register for the free, 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 free training. You will be sold nothing. Come and let me help you build your community, find your frequency, brand, and build all of that incrementally for you. It's amazing how two people that love what you do can turn into two million in just 20 segments. And whether that's 20 years, 20 months, 20 weeks, 20 days, it's well, well worth it. Ah, Vix, welcome. There we go. Let me... uh, have you join me in that request? The amazing Vix, Vix CEO of the Git Podcast. Uh, Hello, thank you for having me. Hi, how are you? Good, how are you? Yeah, I just had to have you back on and say hi. <laughs> I'm so excited. I'm so excited. We had such a great conversation on LinkedIn a few weeks ago. I know. Now Instagram, let's run it, run it back, and teach people. Well. Give people an idea of what your podcast is about and why you created it. Yeah, so I created um, my podcast called The Get Podcast in 2018 to help people get everything they want to create a life they love, which is basically the function of my business. But I found in my digital marketing agency and in all of my work, 
that I was talking to really cool people and that because of my experiences in television and journalism and all this stuff, I had a really great network of people who know how to get exactly what they want. So that's what I was doing. I was bringing them on and sharing their stories. And then I actually turned one of them into my co-host. She's a good friend of mine. Um, so now we talk to entrepreneurs about how intentional about, I hate that word, but also figuring out ways to really continue to move forward. You know, I wanted to have you on too, Vix, because um, what you teach is really aligned with what I, you know, am trying to empower people, which I think is a secret to happiness. But you really dance between what you want and your why. Can you share with us your perspective of the relationship between what you want and how people say, oh, I, I don't know my why, I don't know my purpose. How are those interrelated to you? Yeah, so I think it's interesting. People always talk about that, right? Like, what's my why? Um, I, I feel like people probably- I love that you mock it like that, like I do. What's my why? <laughs> like, that's not, no, like, let's start over. <laughs> you should know your purpose. I mean, I have known my purpose since I'm small. Um, so <laughs> what I like to say is how they're connected though, it really does, you can't build the bridge if you don't know where you are and where you wanna go. That's how I phrase it. So I often say, you know, for me, when I started my company and when I went off on my own, it was about diversity by design. I don't consider making sure that our content is diverse. It is diverse because humanity is diverse. So like that is my personal feeling on that. And I think that really helping people understand what they're passionate about. I think a lot of people take passion out of their purpose, but really if you're not passionate about what you're doing, why are you doing it in the first place? That's a great point. And I think everybody already knows their why and they're using their what as an, an excuse. I like uh, an excuse. And so what, what are some of the things we can do to figure out? Because I, I think once people figure out what they want, we can teach them to allow the how to happen. And there's a few yeah. strategies and techniques in order to facilitate it. But I still think the hardest block or resistance or obstacle or void from people getting what they want is they don't take the time to figure out what they want. And they don't understand that it's allowed to change. Yeah, I think permission is a big thing. You know, everybody talks about the COVID pivot, but I think it's more about the COVID permission. So we have figured out that we can kind of give ourselves permission to be the fullest extent of ourselves. And, you know, I think for a lot of people who maybe work in corporate, you know, I like to say your side hustle is your success story. Even when you have a business, you're still your side hustle. And like that has been my guiding purpose. So I, I think that, you know, if we really look at it, as giving yourself permission to move forward no matter if it looks the way it looked 10 years ago, five years ago, five minutes ago, by saying, okay, this is the new landscape. Here's what I'm allowing to come into this space. And here's what I'm not allowing to come into this space. And I think that, you know, that really has a lot to do with getting across this bridge that you're building from where you are and where you want to be. You know, it's so funny as you break down the three types of people during this accelerated time of uncertainty and accelerated time of change, because uncertainty and change has always existed. Uh, they just accelerate and slow down at different paces, determined upon what's important to your values or what's going around around you and your society. Um, but the resilient people will always find the opportunities. The stable people will always stay the same. And the victims will always sing, why me? Uh, right, where the resilient people will sing, try me. And that's never more apparent than when the entire world is under the stress of questioning human existence, right? For the first time, we all have to question whether we're going to exist or not in a simultaneous accelerated pace. And I think that's what's so interesting. But yet, human nature never changes in the techniques and the strategies. And I love the fact that you talk about permission because for me, part of giving permission to yourself uh, is taking inventory. And mm -hmm. I always say people, number one, you should take inventory of your values every day, personal, experiential, giving and receiving. But more importantly, one thing that's tied to permission that I'd like to get your perspective on um, is hypocrisy. I think people, they feel as if in, in that word pivot or permission, that in order to have permission, now they have an excuse for being a hypocrite. Oh, I changed my mind, you know, oh, my business changed. Well, I have pride in, and if you connect the dots backwards into my career and my life, I've taken pride in the fact that I'm a hypocrite. Like, because I would rather people judge me. I went to dinner last night with one of my oldest friends in the world, and I was on a, a, in the Super Bowl in this interview, and this guy says, oh, I met one of your best friends as a kid, and, you know, he told me that you're full of shit. 
And I was like, what? And this is on like a Super Bowl interview. I was like, oh, I go, who was it? And he told me the guy's name. I go, yeah, you know why? Because I was. We were best friends when I was 17, 18, and 19. And I was an overseller, back-end seller, manipulator, liar, and cheater. And I was one of the best at it, which made me millions of dollars out of law school. Um, but I've learned my lesson since. And I'm a hypocrite because my values have completely changed. But I've given myself permission to right. do that. How have you, because I can tell you're very comfortable with growing and changing and being able to say, hey, I'm a hypocrite. Yeah, I thought that, especially in your profession, right? It changes so fast. How do you feel comfortable giving yourself permission to be a hypocrite? I think so. Again, I, I think that this is an interesting thing between the feminine and the masculine energy and conversation and why I like working with men. Because the way I say it is I give myself grace. So I give myself grace for growth as of, yeah, I am a hypocrite, sure. I was so adamant that like Snapchat would be a thing that I bought the URL snapchatmarketer.tv. I was like, this is gonna be a thing, we're gonna do this. And it's not, the only reason I thought it had legs was because it was an untapped market, right? So I think there's something to be said for the hypocrisy of understanding that if you can look forward and forecast, that makes you really good at what you do because we have to, that's kind of our job in every profession. But I think also understanding that you could be all in on something and you're, you have to have backtrack. So you should always have that plan to backtrack. Cause I think being a hypocrite is good if you are kind to yourself and like also kind to others in the processing it or vixing it as I like to say. <laughs> I love that. Yeah, I like to vix my life too. That's awesome. And I love, I look for energies as well. It's funny. People don't Everybody distinguish, you know, female and male. <laughs> That's such great branding. <laughs> Get your VIX. Um, and, uh, but, you know, it's really interesting, as you kind of indicated, with different people's energies and reading those, when you're trying to develop this, you know, plan, I think part of it is to understand that, you know, you're going to be laughed at. Something's going to laugh at you at one time or another, because if you were that, clear and aware of what was going to happen in the future you probably won't even want to live you you won't want to be here life would be so boring and yet we lie to ourselves all the time and what i have learned you know in all these years is if i'm all in on something right i'm really not all in what i'm trying to do is develop skills towards that objective knowledge of that objectives with a keen desire to be what i must be of that objective Willing, though, to change my mind at any instant of a second. Like, you know, yeah. it, it's amazing. I had an employee yesterday. <laughs> we were so focused on our well-developed plan for the business. And he got a, a tragedy call for a family issue. I could see it in an instant of a second, his entire value system change. Right. Right. He, I mean, he was all in. You know, I mean, probably a little bit too much. I almost worry about him because he's so young and so excited about what we're doing. But he's all in. One phone call, tears in his eyes, his entire perspective and value system changed. And I wanted him and to give permission to himself to be that hypocrite and be like, hey man, I know I told you this is the most important thing to me and I give my first one in, last one to leave, I give my life to it. Right. Oh, but now this is more important. Beautiful, right? And I think not enough people give other people permission as well. How? Can we get more of an accepting feeling from our parents, our friends, our associates, that they give us permission to be the hypocrites that we are? Or I would like more instead to say the expanding, accelerating people, uh, beings that we are. I, you know, I think a lot of it comes down to comfort, right? I think we need to be comfortable with the people we work with. But you really can't be comfortable with the people you work with unless you give them a view of yourself, right? So Brene Brown is, is someone who I follow and who I really like and respect. And she has this concept of, um, and I will bung, you know, we'll, we'll bungle this up a little bit, but it's it's there basically. I'll give you the short version. So essentially- Give me the big version. Yeah, the big version. So she, uh, and Brene, like, I, my apologies. Um, but if she ever gets this, because the internet is wild. Yeah. So she, she calls it, you know, uh, jar friends, like marble jar friends. So your marble jar friends are people who you try different things with, and then you see if they are willing to like accept you for who you are, but then also like change your mind, right? So you give little pieces of yourself, little by little, and if they are open to taking that, then you, you see that they are worth more. So I invest in my friends that way, I invest in my community that way, in my contractors, in the people that I work with on a regular basis that way, 
And I really try to find new ways to help people feel more comfortable and more expansive in their interactions with me. But I think that you as a person have to be willing to say like, okay, they may show me something that I don't like, but that doesn't mean that I have to hate them as a person. Like, I think we get too personal in this because otherwise if you're not willing to maybe not like one aspect of someone, but to reconcile it with your overall thought of them, I think that, I think that's where we, we have this disconnect and everything becomes so personal, even when sharing your personality doesn't have to be this like black or white. It's gray. The whole world is gray to me. I'm with you and I have a couple of my siblings that is black and white and it's always created a separation between us because you know when you're a great person and you're looking for the superpowers and everything and getting the superpowers from people and they're so black and white and they don't understand why I get some superpowers from you and then I get the evil day from you as well and so therefore I have to make a decision do do I like you and when I like you for the things that I like you for. And I'm going to look and look for, and you know, that's why I have a happy marriage. I, if I look for the stuff that drive me crazy about my wife and not look for the, like it, it would end in divorce in two seconds, but I'm always looking for the superpowers of, you know, the most important person to me. And it's just completely enhanced my life. You're an expert at building communities. I'm doing a training about building a community. I've worked really hard uh, with people like you to build a community and have some unique things. What, as a last question, is your best advice uh, to a personal brand uh, for someone that wants to start building a community? What advice would you give them? This is the perfect last question because I was hypocritical about this. So I often said that I was the most private public person you'll ever meet. And I wasn't really sharing like a lot of me as a human, right? I wasn't talking about what I considered the personal bucket. So my relationships, my, you know, being a dog parent, all those things. And then ultimately, like when I have kids talking about that, but I was sharing so many different things that seems personal, how much money I made, how I was making money, all that, right? So for a personal brand to build community, my biggest and best piece of advice is share all of yourself in order to get back all of the people you want to bring into your community. Because if you don't share each avatar, right, theoretically, like get started each version of who you are you're not going to be able to attract the different versions of who you were and who you're becoming so i think if you can do that then that really helps you get grounded and get connected and and really build a true community because community only builds on shared human connection and it's hard to do that digitally but not impossible and you do a great job of doing that and i appreciate all your advice and help and yes we have snapshots and that's exactly one of the strategies that I have is understand who knows what snapshot of you and allow them to see the, as they say, authentic, but I just say your true vibration and, illum and illuminate it, right? Don't just hide behind it or omit it. Illuminate who you are, strengthen that signal, hand spectrum, and have a clear message of, of the best hypocrite you can be. And you and I are two of the best hypocrites I know, and it was so nice for you to join me. I thank love you. it. Vix, thank you, thank you, thank you. I'll talk to you soon. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Great, what a genius, she is amazing. Get your Vix, that right there at the Get Podcast with Vix, she's amazing. I got my boys here from Dugout Mugs. I know there's not much going on in the dugout right now, uh, but make your uh, life a, a dugout. Let me see where my friends are and we'll bring them in uh, real quick here. Randall, Chris, I hopefully you're both here. Let's see, you joining me. Here we go. Which one? I got a black screen. Hey guys, you there? Hey, can you hear us? I can hear you, but it looks like nighttime. Hey Jeremy, good there we go. Oh, there and God is. said, let there be light. And there was. <laughs> you got you two do not look like sports guys at all. <laughs> <laughs> It'd be such a great podcast if you saw. Hopefully you see what I see. I'm like. Dude, what podcast do these guys do? I want to listen. There's no sports, but I bet they know a ton about sports. Oh, my gosh. Anyway, I'm, as you know, a huge fan of Dugout Mugs. You guys have such a unique – I see them there behind you. If anyone doesn't know what they are, they're a mug that – like right there is a barrel of a baseball bat, and they're custom with great mar marketing and logos, et cetera. Now, obviously, you guys are sitting in a space like me uh, that part of it died, <laughs> Right. A big part of it died. How are you leveraging that? Because I can see a bunch of different ways that this could work to your advantage. How have you been leveraging what's going on in sports to build a community for dugout uh, mugs? 
Okay. Well, <laughs> well, I mean, we well, the, the cool part, actually, that's what makes us good partners, man, is we have different opinions and different angles and different thought processes on everything. Um, originally, when, when things like started. each other going, anyway, right? Yeah, no, we get along great, actually. We're, we could literally be this close, and it's not a problem. <laughs> um, but, no, so when, when baseball was going out, um, you know, things were going on, the COVID thing hit, we, we got a little nervous for about a week. And, and at that point, we decided to either, you know, face the problem or think around it. And thinking around problems is, like, kind of like my thing. I, I don't really like to dwell on it too long. So we figured out how to go around it. Well, we doubled and tripled down, and we started identifying, and, and this was a, a thought I had that we really um, – we mesh well with is, is uh, go after the industries that were hurting and be an olive branch, be like a way of, of, of like a lifesaver for them. So we started finding, um, we did a great deal with Pete Rose, for example, and Pete's a in-person signing kind of guy. But what we did is now we were able to do a no money down deal with Pete where we did, where he paid him a, a royalty on everything we sold. So we acquired Field of Dreams, Pete Rose. We did a deal with Pudge, Rodriguez, Ozzy, I have a whole list up here at whiteboard. So I was, you know, again, we just had to get creative, you know, and, and leverage a time when everybody's on social media. So we, we forexed on social media and content creation and also, and doing it in a way of, of being a helper, right. And, and, and helping out some of these industries and minor league baseball, we let minor league players come on as affiliates of our company because they're not getting paid. So now there's a way where they can get paid money and, promote our products. So we just got creative, really. That's, su I mean, super powerful because it's so interesting in my space is that people immediately that were working with in-person signings, appearances, even on the, you know, personal brand side for me, speaking engagements, all of these, I doubled and tripled down. That was the first thing that I said early in March. I said, look, you know, human nature never changes. This thing is going to get pretty fugly pretty fast. And, you know, we have all of these relationships. How can we be of service or value? That's what you guys ask. That's your, your workaround is, and, it, and that's why I love you both, right? You always are of, hey, how can we be of service or value? And, you know, how or who do you know that can help us? And you created these unbelievable win-win situations. Um, you know, in that respect too, you created a great, you know, pre-vaccine strategy, but we are going to get back to, you know, full sports, at least on TV, and eventually filling stadiums and arenas again with ma mass gatherings. What perspective has changed through the lessons that you learned that you're going to carry through post-vaccine? I think one of the most important things that we've realized is uh, owning databases. So having customers that we can remarket to through channels of, of email and SMS campaigns, um, having that information, having having their phone numbers and emails in times that have that, that possibly get a little bit scary or get a little bit low, being able to remarket to them, we've we've uh, we've realized the importance of capturing that information because um, it's always going to be there for us. Yeah, I, I'm I'm a huge person of I say in person when we can do in person on the phone. Uh, so that means voice uh, and SMS. Uh, and I use uh, community as my SMS service. Do you guys have a recommendation on that? Because a lot of people are hitting me up for the best, you know, text messaging side of things. Do you guys have a service or do you do it built your own? Yeah, we have a service. Uh, it's been a great experience. It's with a company by the name of Emotive. Emotive, yeah. I mean, I put it out there for people because I think it's so important. The open rates of, of a text message are incredible. And I think people don't realize uh, the power of collecting a phone number. Um, and people don't use, I'm going to do a training. I'm doing a training this Friday on building a community. But after that, on toughness and telephone. Uh, and cause I think people are missing the boat for the future. They're looking past uh, the telephone uh, exponentially because they're so caught up into Instagram and Facebook and, and everything else. Um, for, furthermore, I've got, I got one more thing to add on that day. Honestly, um, one of the things I think really stood out to us from a post vaccine or, you know, the post pandemic kind of situation is, is how to be completely genuine. Right. So the, we literally went to our, the baseball world as a whole, but our, our tribe in particular, which is, you know, 150,000 people and, we said, hey, we, you know, we need your help. You, you've supported us. We're supported you. Like, and, and I mean, because we are genuine since day one, 
everybody rallied behind us and we saw huge in, in uh, spikes in sales and things like that. So I think that's another big thing. It's just business in general. I mean, it sounds like common sense, but it's not done often enough is being truly genuine with your audience. Um, and that ties into, you know, building an audience and then treating them the right way. Well, I think that authenticity and genuineness is beyond just you two guys from my experience over the years of working with you, you know, and from day one, it was like, sending a personalized product to me without even knowing who it was and then feeling the integrity of the the energy and integrity of the product and i don't know if you have one right there that you can hold up for me because i can show the uniqueness uh i couldn't tell depth wise if you could reach behind you <laughs> so i i mean so i get one of these years ago years ago in the mail right and i'm like what the heck is this and you know had our logo on it for Warren Moon and myself and just felt it. And it wasn't like this cheap, you, you know what I mean? It was completely genuine and different. It's solid. It, it's solid like you guys, right? And there's just an energy about it. And my favorite thing that you said is that you kind of reached out and not only said, hey, how can we be of service or value, but what can you do to help us? Who do you know, right, that can help us? And that question, it, it's so funny because I, you know, have built a huge practice. And one of the key comments that I get is, oh my God, Dave Meltzer made me millions of dollars uh, because, you know, I asked, <laughs> right? I, I love that. It's like, I get accredited for being like a huge genius because I'm inspiring people to ask for help. Um, you know, and it's the simple things like they saying, thank you. I think, you know, I tease my wife. I go, if I ever die and people are talking about my legacy, it's going to sound silly to like generations. My great grandkids would be like, Oh my God, your great grandpa was amazing. He taught me to say thank you and to ask, right? <laughs> like literally, he made millions yeah. of dollars teaching people how to say thank you and to ask. And that's going to be my legacy. He's asking the right questions. Yeah. You know what I mean? Well, um, I believe network, network is net worth for sure. And I've, I've spent a decade or more. I think honestly, that's why we were able to launch Pat Dugout Mug so fast is because some people in, in my network, when we first got together, it was just boom, boom. So yeah, but you gotta, you gotta be very um, specific with what you're asking for and always hold up your end of the bargain though too. You know, when you get with what you're asking for, always come through, you know, so that's the second part of it. Yeah, you know, like there's those old sayings, I study history a lot, you know, because human nature never changes. And it's like people that make their way, that's you guys, people that do what they say, that's you guys, right? Like all, all these like basic things that were written literally in the Sanskrit thousands and thousands of years ago are still applicable today to two dugout rats like you that started some company by taking a baseball bat and making a mug, right? That is a great branding and marketing tool, et cetera. One of the other things about asking, and I really can attribute to both of you through the years that I've known you, is being more interested than interesting, right? Like you, you've never like piled on and I've never seen you pile on features and benefits to people and talk about how great and blah, blah, blah. It's always, you're more interested in tell me what you're doing today. Tell me what you like about it. What don't you like about it? Learning about what they're doing and saying, oh, you know, I got someone that can help you. Or you know what? I can help you. Would it help you if? And when you talk about asking the right questions, I see both of you guys doing that in an authentic, organic way of truly, sincerely, hey, tell me about what you're doing. Right, I really want to know, and that's kind of those initial calls that you made when all of this happened. What uh, are some of the, the big wins during you know this time for you, and how did they happen? Are you talking about during the pandemic yeah, thing? Yeah, on the on that you know, what what uh, Vix was talking about in this time of permission, not pivot, <laughs> giving permission to yourself to change ways. Um, some of the the biggest change, the biggest. Or, or one big win, one big win. I just like to tee pragmatically for people to be like, okay, here's two entrepreneurs, completely different personalities, different opinions. This happens. They obviously have to create a permission for themselves to change. And you guys probably had one thing that immediately is like, okay, I did this. And then this occurred because of it. Was it the Pete Rose thing? Was it called, like, what, what big ch change and how did it happen? I think we, we learned pretty early that retail was going to be something that that we shouldn't even put any energy into at all. And we quickly pivoted everything to e-com. Uh, all resources, good good employees that we had on the retail side of things. Uh, we completely pulled them out and we plugged them into the into the e-com side of the business. And we saw that uh, a bunch of 
uh, attention was going to that particular section of the business. And so we figured out ways to plug holes that could, could pop up within that particular vertical. And we just, we doubled down on the e-com side of things and it, it ended up resulting in it growing in, well, in a big we, way. We hired eight people last month, you know? So I think from a cause and effect standpoint, we realize, you know, you're not going to put a round peg in a square hole. And I think the, the, the real setup was us being versatile, you know, not having all your eggs in one basket. Too many people are just like one trick pony kind of thing. So we, we were able to have kind of a little bit more of a spread. And when something was working, you do more of that. When something isn't working, you stop doing that, right? It's just simple. And, and in turn, we doubled and tripled in maybe even quadrupled down on, on e -com. And in turn, we ended up hiring eight people and we've seen somewhere between two and a half and three X sales increases. Um, so that's not bad. Not bad at all. La last question about employees. So it's one thing for you two to have the relationship that you have and the expansive vision, uh, no matter what's going on with the compressed times of uncertainty or accelerated change. How do you extend that out into the employee side when they're working virtually or shifting their focus from retail to e-com, whatever it may be? What are some of the key principles or values that you guys utilize in order to extend that culture that you have built between the two of you? One of the, uh, well, I, something that I uh, am slowly but surely grasping is that it's always a trickle down effect. Uh, however we are is, typically a reflection of what's going on b below us. Um, one of the things that I'm uh, attempting to do is, is uh, or we're attempting to do is, is recreate kind of just this locker room feel, uh, just a team in general, just all pulling from the same side of the rope and um, just getting that kind of baseball culture and uh, to, to be within our business as well. Yeah, I, lo I love that kind of locker room approach. You know, if you guys, I know when you quit your sport, I would say the first death of your life is when you quit the sport that you love, either because you suck or you're old. Those are the two reasons, or you get hurt. Um, those are like the three reasons I've learned as a sports agent that people have to quit playing, whether it's in, you know, high school, college, or pro, it's always the same. But the number one thing that everybody misses is the locker room. So I've always tried to mirror the values of a locker room, the communication of a locker room, the bureaucracy of a locker room, because if that's the number one thing that most people miss about what they think sports is, right? Nobody says, oh man, you know, I miss getting at bat. Like they all talk about the locker room. Right? And I'm talking about Hall of Famers down to the guys that were the weekend warriors that, you know, sat on the bench in high school. You know, that whole spectrum, the locker room is so important. And you guys are creating an extraordinary locker room. And you can see why. And I appreciate you also, you know, being so honest and open so everybody uh, can share in your experience so that they can get better as well. Um, I saw a few people that want to get some uh, dugout uh, gear and, and mugs. So I saw Kate especially. Where, where can they go and order them right now on the e-com side? Dugoutmugs.com. That's, think, right. <laughs> that's as easy as it comes. Well, I appreciate it, man. I appreciate you guys being part of my community, building that community, which is shared between us. And that's what I'm doing my training on Friday. So I appreciate if you guys invite your whole company. It's free. Have them come to my trainings on Friday or at least watch the replays. Anything I can do will be a service. I love your product and I love you too. So thanks for coming on. Thanks, appreciate Dave. you. Thanks, Dave. Thanks, Take Dave. it easy, man. I don't like that hat, though. Take care. <laughs> <laughs> Forget the Rangers. They're almost as bad as the Padres. They got so much talent and never win. What the heck? Pofter. Uh, anyway. All right. Uh, yeah, Kate. Everyone's son. Love. My son loves his dugout mugs. They're, they're really cool. Um, anyway, let's finish up with a question or two. Don't forget Friday free training. You can text me 949-298-2905. Email me directly at david at dmeltzer.com. Register for free, free, free. Nothing will be sold to you. We're just going to talk about how to build a community so you can help more people, help more people, be happy, the greatest virus of all time, spread simply by witnessing it, strengthens your immune system so it protects you from everything. It'll strengthen you spiritually, mentally, emotionally. All of that there. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, Another Mike Scott, so many Mike Scotts in my life. Uh, how do you start your morning meditating every day? My highest frequency, I'm not living the myth of Sisyphus. I'm not pushing a boulder to the top of the hill just to have it fall down and we start over every morning. Just simply, I am 
pushing it up, plateauing and growing, using meditation to find my highest frequency uh, right away. Um, what are your thoughts about the business side of cannabis industry? Look, every industry, my thoughts are the same, right? Find where your capabilities, that's your skills, your knowledge and desire, are synergistic or supplementary to where you can make more money, help more people and have more fun. I don't care what industry it is. I'm learning about so many different industries where you can do that. So if your backdrop is cannabis, then find how your skills, knowledge and desire align synergistic or supplementary to how you can make more money, help more people and have more fun. It's that easy. People get confused and they get caught up in the industry instead of in the capabilities. Industry, Nada. Capabilities, total. That's right. Everything's about the capabilities you have. Industry's just the backdrop, right? Just the backdrop. How to become a millionaire. Enjoy the consistent, persistent pursuit of your potential of how much money you can make. Enjoy the consistent every day. Persistent without quit. Potential of how much money you can make. Look at things and connect the dots backwards on how they are monetized. Don't fool yourself. Extract your emotion. People buy on emotion for logical reasons. They also run businesses on emotions. Be very clear. Do the math. Make sure that you're profitable. That's how you'll be a millionaire and save as much of it as you can. Save it in a guaranteed security as much as you can. Focus in on doubling the amount of money that you make as fast as you can and putting it away, right? There's two ways to make money. Bake it and save it. Don't risk it. Utilize your own time and risk tolerance in order to effectuate how much money you can make and how much money you can save. Your life changes when you got a million dollars in the bank. Trust me, your decisions change. All right, last question, and then we are going to call it a day. Make sure you join me on... Uh, Friday, uh, 11 a.m. Pacific, 2 p.m. Eastern. Text me, 949-298-2905. Email me, david at dmelter.com. It's free, free, free. Join me, bring your friends, family, etc. We're going to learn a lot about building a community. We are all one. A tree has no branches. Let's build that community. Let's make more money, help more people, have more fun. Let's empower others to empower others to be happy. Last question, Nick, any advice on dealing with fear of going all in on launching your brand or company? Look, my whole life is going all in. It's not just my brand, right? Going all in to me is utilizing my life with a lens of productivity. How much value am I providing? Accessibility, how accessible am I to others? How am I accessing what I want, knowing my what? And utilizing the lens of gratitude, meaning everything that I do, I'm finding the light, the love, and the lessons to find my higher frequency, to expand, to grow, and accelerate, to live the best life and highest frequency that I can. That's what it's about. And if you practice ending fear, it'll allow you to create less resistance, interference, corrosion, void, shortages, and obstacles, and allow things to happen faster, more rapidly and accurately, to get what you want, to help others, to help others, to empower others, to empower others, to elevate others, to elevate yourself. You guys hear me. It's real talk, as Jeff says. We are going to be here tomorrow at 8 a.m., but most importantly, please join me. Invite your friends, family, and associates to come to my Friday training. You can register at the text number below, 949-298-2905. And email me, david at dmeltzer.com. Everyone have a beautiful day. And remember, most importantly, be kind to your future self and do good deeds. Thank you.